thrilled to death and we've got a list of all the corporate sponsors that have been that have uh, have given and people have given in the names of other folks but but that is wonderful that is wonderful uh, I just uh, <clears throat> I find it almost hard to believe uh, me of little faith uh, when I looked at that uh, I looked you know the, what we were going to have to do and I said eh, no but, but uh, it's it's all coming true so if um, I encourage you to to um, continue with that, and we'll make our goal, and we will do a lot of a lot of kids a lot of good with this with this mission. So, um, <clears throat> as I announced yesterday, if you if you've maybe noticed back on the wall back there, there's a piece of equipment. Uh, uh, Trent and uh, Jacob got the uh, camera uh, put up yesterday. And so, you all have already been on television this morning. You just don't know that. Uh, so, so you know, you can either use that to your advantage and walk piously into church, or you can come in like the Holy Spirit doesn't got a hold of you. So, but uh, anyway, so we are just going to be anxious to see how this all works out when we get home and see how see how it broadcasts this morning. Uh, Jake. Where are you hiding? Uh, are they going to stay? Are we going to stay on Facebook? Or are you going to go to? Uh... I think we're going to stay on Facebook for now. Okay. Until we kind of figure things out. Okay. So at some point we may be going to uh, uh, YouTube, back to YouTube again, and to uh, Facebook also. But but anyway, I encourage you if if uh, if you can't be here or you know people who would like to see our services, encourage them to watch. And we'll see how it's going to happen. Do we have any joys, concerns, prayers, well wishes? Anybody? Yes, Nancy. Fifty-two years today. Well, congratulations, congratulations. Too bad it's not a sunny day and he couldn't can't take you off for a ride for a motorcycle ride to celebrate. All right, wonderful, wonderful. All right, other joys, concerns. It's great to see you all here. All right, then let's, uh, I'm sorry. All right, Nancy. Okay, what's the name? Brenda Craig. Brenda Craig, okay, we will. But I will, Brenda. K R I E T. K R I E Krieg. Okay. All right. Others. All right. I'm glad to say uh, that um, uh, our we got you know we have three folks up at uh, St. Paul's with with cancer, and uh, they were all in church this morning. So that was a, that was good news too. All right. It's, Put our hearts and minds in the spirit of prayer and the spirit of worship, and let's give God praise.
Would you stand with me now as we uh, say together our call for worship? Come and worship. We are here with God's spirit among us. For God re reveals God's self to us today. As the good shepherd, we are our rest and comfort. As the holy lamb, worthy of our eternal praise. As the giver of new life and hope. We are here with God's Spirit among us. We worship you today, Holy Trinity God. Remain standing, please, as we sing together, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
Please remain standing and join me in our unison prayer of confession. Jesus, our Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for what we have done but shouldn't have, for what we should have done but didn't. We yearn to hear your voice, gentle shepherd, but listen to our own voices instead. We want to care for our sisters and brothers, to comfort them when they hurt, to give what we have to people who have less, but we choose to keep our possessions and blessings to ourselves. We ask for your forgiveness and mercy, Father God. Amen. Children of God, hear these words of promise. Christ our shepherd joyfully welcomes us back into the fold of love and freedom, teaching us to know his voice. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins have now been forgiven. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The word of God this morning comes, <clears throat> comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. That evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. But suddenly Jesus was standing there amongst them, and peace be with you, he said, as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. And he spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I now send you. And then he breathed upon them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. And one of the disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. <clears throat> but he replied, I'm not going to believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands and I put my fingers in them and I place my hand into the wound in his side. And eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. And the doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing amongst them and he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me and believe anyway. And Jesus' disciples saw him do many other miraculous signs besides the ones that are recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life. Here is the reading of the Holy Gospel, the Word of God, the good news. Amen. Would you turn to hymn number 215, Alleluia, Alleluia.
Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Father, too often we walk around not seeing the problems that are right in front of us and all the while saying that seeing is believing. We are blind to what we should see and demanding to see what we should take on faith, Lord God. We pray that you will correct our thinking. Amen. Second Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, I have that, I have that verse printed on a t-shirt. I have it in English and I have it in Braille. And I like it, first of all, because it is true. We do walk by faith, not by sight. And second of all, I like it that because thanks to a young lady in our own parish right here, it has brought to me a new awareness of the strength and the trust required of the non-sighted folks in our sighted world. And if you think about that for a second, every step, every single step that a non-sighted person takes is an absolute step of faith. And I so admire them for that. But we're going to get to that verse in a few moments. Scripture that I read today came from John 20, verses 19 through 31. And the scriptures tell us that it was on the evening of the first day of the week, and I take that to be what we would call Easter Sunday, which was in fact the first day after the Sabbath. And that would therefore mean that this, this was the evening of the day that Christ rose, that, that uh, the first event is happening. And a couple of interesting things is, is happening as we find in the gospel narrative at this point when Jesus begins to make appearances. The biggest thing is he is not recognized. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, didn't he? She's standing out at the tomb and, and Jesus appears behind her, behind her and she and she turns around and she doesn't know who she's looking at. She doesn't, she doesn't recognize him until he speaks her name and says, Mary. If we turn to the gospel of Luke 24, verses 13 through 49, this chapter tells us that on that same day, on that very same day, after Jesus has risen, after the disciples have been to the tomb, Jesus uh, appears, or there's two apostles walking to Emmaus, and they're walking along and they're talking about, you know, their despair, actually, and what's going on and talking about this crucifixion of Jesus and the burial of Jesus. And Jesus appears behind them and he catches up to them and, and he asks them, what are you talking about? Who, what's going on that, what's this that you're discussing? And they say, you know, you got to be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know. So I, I don't know, I don't understand. You don't know what's happening. Jesus of Nazareth, whom we thought was the Messiah, has been killed. He's been, he's been crucified and he's been buried. And then uh, they just don't recognize who he is. But scripture says, but they were kept from recognizing him by divine intervention. I love that phrase because it's one of the few phrases at times we see that in our Bible. Divine intervention. God has interfered with their lives. God has kept them for some reason from not recognizing Jesus. And now it's the evening of the first day and Jesus has now appeared to a room full of his disciples. And when this happens, they're, they're scared to death. They're, they're all afraid and they, they think they're seeing a ghost. And Luke 24 verses 40, 43, he says, and when he had said this, because you know he came in, he says, peace be with you. And it says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands, he showed him his feet, and while they were still, they still didn't believe him because of joy and amazing amazement, and he asked them, do you have anything to eat? What a thing for a risen Savior to ask. Do you have anything to eat? That phrase always amazes me, but it shows he's not a ghost. He is, in fact, has returned to life. And says they gave him a piece of broad fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. So let's consider what we have here in our story. Three appearances by Jesus to people who loved him the absolute most and none of them recognize him until he gives them some kind of a sign by which they could recognize him. 
Now, we don't know if Jesus' appearance has changed in some way. You know, it did on uh, when Jesus uh, did it on Transfiguration Day when he's up on the mountain with the, the three disciples. It says his body changed and he was radiantly white. And, but this, they, at least they knew then that it was Jesus. But we also don't know if it, they didn't recognize, all of, all of them didn't recognize him because of this divine intervention by the Lord God. The point here is that it was for some amount of time in each of these instances they were seeing but they're not believing. They're seeing the Lord Jesus Christ standing in front of them but they're not believing that it was him. Now you've heard me say it before and I still think that the disciple Thomas gets a raw deal in this narrative over the course of history and I don't mind being Thomas's advocate. You know, the disciples tell Thomas that uh, we've seen the Lord and he is alive. He was here with us. And Thomas's answer, as we know, was unless I see the nail marks in his hands and, and can put my, put my finger where the nails were, unless I can put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe this. Well, according to the scripture by John, another week goes by. And the disciples had met once again in, 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 in a home. And this time, Thomas is with them. And Jesus appears to them. This, you think about this as a week later, a week after so, that would be today. This would be the anniversary of that event happening today. John 20, 27, 29. And then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. See, he didn't have to, he didn't have to put his hands in the holes. Jesus had given him an invitation and he believed. And he, he calls him my Lord and my God. And then Jesus tells him, because you have seen me, you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I fully understand the words of Jesus Christ and I certainly believe and agree with them. But and again, in defense of Brother Thomas, none of the other disciples had believed it either, had they? And frankly, frankly, if I had seen that bloody and beaten and dead body that they put in that tomb, I wouldn't have believed that that was Jesus standing in front of me either at first. I just know I wouldn't. They had heard the words. They had heard the predictions from Jesus for three years that he was in fact going to be killed. He was going in fact going to die, but that he would be raised again from the dead. And yet we don't have a single verse from any of the gospel writers in any of the scriptures that tells us that the disciples were sitting in that room and, and sitting on pins and needles waiting for Jesus to actually arise and come back. They didn't watch for him while he was in the garden before he was arrested and they were not sitting and watching for him to return after he had been crucified. What they were doing is what you and I would have been doing, hiding and grieving because they thought they had lost it all. But the resurrection of which Jesus spoke, it had happened. It had happened. Jesus Christ had walked out of the tomb. Jesus had already, we know, demonstrated his power over death with three other resurrections during his earthly ministry, including the most famous, the resurrection of Lazarus. But none of those people that he resurrected before had predicted they were going to be killed and rise from the grave. Jesus made it happen. The Lord God made it happen. But Jesus Christ predicted it. He predicted it time and time again. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep and the world of his followers. This is the eternal impact on all of us who believe in him. You see, we were crucified with him. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were quickened, brought back to life with him. 
we were raised with him. <clears throat> and we have been made <clears throat> to sit with him in heavenly places. He is the first fruits. We are the harvest that follows. You know, if there is a good current worldly example of the resurrection, I think it might be this. Many, some of you have probably been, been where I'm going to be talking about. 200 miles northeast of Los Angeles, there is a, a baked out gorge. It's called Death Valley. It's the lowest place in the United States, 276 feet below sea level. It's also the hottest place in this country with an official recording of 134 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't go out there unless you know exactly what you're doing. You don't go out there unless you are totally prepared. You don't go alone and you tell other people when and where you're going, what route you're going to be taking. It is a totally unforgiving place. There are streams that flow into Death Valley from the surrounding mountains only to evaporate out there in that scorching heat. And there's only like a two and a half inches of rain a year that actually falls each year on the Death Valley. A half inch of rain in the surrounding mountains, when it does come, quickly becomes a, a rushing torrent as it, as it comes across that hard ground and baked ground. And people actually die out there being drowned in the middle of a desert because they were not prepared. Miss Kate and I have been to the Death Valley several times. And I can tell you there's no sign of life out there to speak of. I will tell you that though that that barrenness, it's both scary, but it's also incredibly beautiful at some times. Some years ago, an amazing thing happened out there. During a freak weather pattern, rain fell out into Death Valley for 19 days straight. And suddenly, suddenly, millions of seeds, millions of seeds that had laid dormant for who knows how many years, possibly even a century, they suddenly sprouted up from the ground and they burst into bloom and the desert floor, the entire desert floor was covered in beauty and flowers. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to behold. You see, this is the message of the resurrection. That is a great example of the resurrection. Life springs forth from death. A desert becomes a garden. Beauty transcends the ugly. Love overcomes hatred. A, empty, a tomb is emptied. The grim and haunting outline of a cross is swallowed in the glow of an Easter morning sunrise. Our Lord Jesus told his disciples, blessed are those who have not seen and, had, and yet have believed. Was he rebuking them? Well, possibly, but maybe not. What I know that he was doing for certain was establishing for them, for us, what was going to be required of the world after he returned to his heavenly home. There would be no more appearances. There would be no more invitations to put our fingers into the holes of his hands or to put our hands into his side. Jesus was not going to be coming back to walk and talk with us. So if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, it must be through faith. One of my favorite authors, which is Philip Yancey, once wrote, in many respects I find an unresurrected Jesus much easier to accept. Easter makes Jesus dangerous. Because of Easter, I now have to listen to his extravagant claims and I can no longer pick and choose from his sayings. Moreover, Easter means that Jesus must be on the loose out there somewhere. And my friends, Jesus Christ is very much alive. Jesus Christ is very much on the loose out there. Jesus is impacting the life of millions of people 
millions of lives every single moment of every single day. And that brings me back to the opening scripture. This was written by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the church at Corinth. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Christian author Tony Cook says, as we remember the crucifixion, know that Jesus was not a helpless victim of mob violence. And this is important for us to remember. Jesus was not a helpless victim of mob violence. Neither was he merely in the wrong place at the wrong time. Peter says Jesus was delivered by, de for, by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. And John calls Jesus the lamb slain for the foundation of the world. Jesus himself says, I lay down my life <clears throat> that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. No. As much as we, as much as we hate the thought of what Jesus went through, as much as we hate all of the betrayals, as much as we hate the whippings, the beatings, and the nailing of this man to a cross and letting him hang there, Jesus Christ was no powerless victim. <clears throat> Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is our Redeemer. His death was as deliberate as his resurrection. He was in exactly the right place at exactly the right time, and all who believe in him are guaranteed eternal beneficiaries of his sacrifice. Jesus did this voluntarily, voluntarily for you and for me. But you know what? For any of this to make any kind of sense, for it to be any kind of use to you, you must have complete faith. You must totally believe it. You can't play with it. You can't play at it. You can't say, well, I'm a Christian. You've got to say, I'm a Christian. You must totally believe it. You can't weed out the parts that make you uncomfortable. Oh, Jesus said that. I, I, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that. Uh -uh. You can't be weeding out parts of the scripture that make you uncomfortable. You must accept it. You must accept it all. And it must become part of your nature, just as Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit must become part of your nature. You must believe that Jesus Christ was and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You must believe that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for you. You must allow the Holy Spirit to become your guide. You must walk by faith because you're not going to see Jesus at a lecture hall. You're not going to see him standing on a pulpit on a big teleprompter. Jesus Christ reigns from the throne next to his Father God. And someday, someday Jesus will return. And when he does, when Jesus comes back, he's not going to be stopping to give advice. He's not going to be stopping to heal people. He's not going to be, he's not going to be talking about anything other than he's calling up the righteous because the end of the age has been reached. Romans 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The blessed news is that you have every minute of your life, every minute of your life to reach out to Jesus and Jesus will take your hand. You have every second of every day to walk with Jesus by faith. And someday, someday, you will be rewarded with the vision of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will be rewarded with the vision of the Son of God in all, all of his majestic glory. We give all God all praise and glory. Amen. <clears throat> Would you stand with me now as we say together that which we believe is found in your bulletin. We believe that God is spirit 
and they that worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. We believe that God is light and that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We believe that God is love and that everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. We believe that he is the resurrection and the life, and that whosoever believes in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We believe that we are children of God and that he has given us his spirit. We believe that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all uncleanliness. We believe that the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the world of God abides forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord. We are still like the disciples and the first apostles, Lord Jesus. We stand in awe of what you did. We rely on and we ask a simple worldly question. How can a man get up and walk out of a tomb? But we must always remember that it wasn't a man at all that walked out of that tomb. It was you, the son of God. And with you, all things are possible. Help us to fully believe that. Help us to ingrain that into the very fabric of our soul. Help us to be bold in proclaiming your story to all the world without any hesitation. Father, Easter Day has happened. The day is over. Most of the decorations are put away. But let us never forget that through the resurrection, though the resurrection is eternal, there is no next day. There is only now as we live in you. So help us all to reflect that Easter glow that comes from gazing into an empty tomb. Let it be a light that we share with eagerness. Father, we're being told that the COVID restrictions on our way of life that have been mandated during the past year have been reduced. Give us the common sense, Father, to not stop being cautious or aware of other people and their surroundings. Let us remember that there are still millions of people in this world that are contracting the virus every day or some variation of it. And so let us walk by faith and not by sight. Lord God, I again ask for your blessings on this parish, on all the worshipers around the world. Let us be united in our proclamation that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and Savior of us all. And we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand now and join in our last hymn, Trusting Jesus, number 355.
Now may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord bring you peace now and forevermore. Amen. that was meant to be.